I want to continue our Bible study series this evening on the uh, on the law, and uh, we have looked at several different aspects. We we looked at the at an introduction uh, to the law. Uh, we went through last time uh, different uh, categories of God's law. We looked and, and saw that there are physical laws in the Bible. There are uh, spiritual laws in the Bible. Uh, there are uh, civil laws and statutes. There are ceremonial uh, laws and regulations in the Bible. We looked uh, also last time to see which categories of the law uh, are not applicable in the New Testament period. And we saw uh, that basically uh, the New Testament summarizes uh, very clearly that, that one is the ceremonial aspects of the law uh, no longer uh, are to be directly applied in the New Testament. That's what we're told in Hebrews, that these thing, the things which stood only in the meat offerings, the drink offerings, the different washings, and the various uh, physical ceremonies, that those things were imposed until the time of Reformation. They were temporary, uh, imposed upon the congregation of Israel until the time of Messiah. Uh, that that's one category of laws. We saw in Hebrews, uh, uh, that's in Hebrews 9, in Hebrews 7, we saw that there was a change of the law regarding the priesthood and that that was specifically spelled out that, that the laws pertaining to the priesthood of Aaron uh, and, and all the things connected with that in terms of to whom goes the tithe and all of the, the specific regulations relating to the priesthood that, that uh, there's a change of the law regarding the priesthood because there's a change of the priesthood we're under today the Melchizedek priesthood which is Jesus Christ and so that was the second category of laws that were changed and a third category of laws uh, were spelled out there in 1 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul that, uh, uh, or rather 2 Corinthians, that the administration of death, that we no longer administer uh, the death penalty, that we are under the administration of the Spirit, uh, and uh, it is a different civil administration. Uh, so we see that there are really only three categories of laws uh, that do not... Uh, apply in a very direct way. We also saw that Jesus Christ came to magnify the law and to uh, emphasize the spirit and intent of the law, which brings us to part of what I want to cover this evening, which is the difference in approach between the, the uh, regarding the law in the New Testament and the way the law came to be regarded among the Jews. When people read the New Testament and they read the gospel encounters that Christ had with the Pharisees, uh, there are those who come away with the idea that somehow Christ was against the law, that the Pharisees were upholding the law and Christ was doing away with the law. And that, of course, is not the case at all. Jesus said uh, very clearly, very plainly in Matthew chapter 5, we had seen this at the beginning of the Bible study series, uh, Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to fill it up to the full. Jesus Christ did not come to tear it down. He came to magnify it, to enhance it, to make the full intent and purpose clear. Now, the Pharisees had a different approach to the law. Their approach, let's just notice their approach summed up by Christ in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, verse 1, Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They sat in the seat of judgment. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not you after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Their works they do to be seen of men. He talks about their approach. Their approach to the law was based on outward show. Christ was not uh, attacking in any way or undermining the law that God gave in the Old Testament because who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus Christ, we're told very clearly 
in in First uh, Corinthians. Uh, that in First Corinthians ten four, that rock which followed them, that spiritual rock followed them, and that rock was Christ. First Corinthians ten four, the the spiritual rock that followed Israel, the rock of Israel was Jesus Christ. He was the one that led them through the wilderness. That spiritual rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. So he was the one that gave them the laws, the statutes, the judgments, the Ten Commandments. He certainly didn't uh, come to, uh, to do away with, quote, his father's commandments, and he didn't come to do away with what he himself had given. But let's, let's notice here. I, I have a book, and I want to read you just a few quotes from, uh, and the title of it is The Essential Talmud. Now, uh, just to read you uh, here from uh, the introduction, it says, It's impossible to understand either Judaism or the Jews themselves, either the system of Jewish belief and practice, uh, without a basic understanding of the Talmud. It is a sacred text and an actual code of law for the governing of civic life. It is the fullest expression of Jewish attitudes and traditions. You see, the... uh, In many ways, the Talmud is the most important book in Jewish culture. Now, you might have thought that the Bible was the most important book. Well, the Bible certainly should be the most important book. But the Talmud is the most important book in Jewish culture. No other work has had a comparable influence on the theory and practice of Jewish life. Now, that ought to tell you something, because the Bible is what should have... We should be able to say of the Bible that no other book other than the Bible, no book other than the Bible has had uh, a comparable influence on the theory and practice of our life, of the Christian life. But the, uh, the, they readily admit this was written by a, a leading rabbi that... Uh, uh, that no other book has had a comparable uh, influence on the theory and practice uh, of the uh, uh, Jewish life. Now, what is the Talmud? Well, the formal definition of the Talmud is that it is the summary of oral law that evolved after centuries of scholarly efforts by sages who lived in Palestine and Babylonia up until the beginning, uh, you know, even stretching on down to the beginning of the Middle Ages. The... uh, The uh, what it really amounts to is it is uh, a repository of the oral law. And the Jews regarded the oral law, now I say the Jews, the Pharisees regarded the oral law as just as significant as the written law. Uh, it uh, goes through and, and deals with, with all sorts of, uh, of things. And uh, the uh, the point is that much of what is brought out in the Talmud, and I may share a few excerpts of it from you uh, with you, are the things that Jesus Christ was addressing and dealing with when he dealt with the Pharisees. The problem, what Jesus Christ expressed, was not a disagreement with the laws of the Bible and the Old Testament. But you see, the, the Pharisees had bound heavy burdens grievous to be borne. Their approach to the law was to, was to invent all sorts of human ideas of do's and don'ts that you can't find if you just read the, the Bible. But they came up with ideas that in their mind carried the law uh, further out. And they gradually developed it. It was something that developed over a period of time. You see, Jesus uh, over and over uh, told them that they were in reality willing to lay aside the law of God so that they may keep their own traditions. In In Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7. Let's pick up the account in verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. 
And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashing hands, they found fault. Now, out by, in my Bible, by the word defiled in verse 2, is a little number 4. And in the margin it says, or common. They saw the disciples eat bread with common hands, or unwashed hands, defiled hands. Now, what did they mean by that? Was there a problem the fact that they said, you know, people ought to wash their hands before they eat? No. They had made a tradition, as we're going to see, that had to do with a particular manner of washing hands. Their problem was that you may have uh, come in contact with something that was ceremonially unclean, particularly you may have brushed against a Gentile. And and so your hands had to be washed because this would somehow uh, condemn uh, any of the food. This you, you don't find that in the Old Testament. You find that uh, in the tradition that they had had. So they saw the disciples eat bread uh, with, un, with defiled hands, that is to say unwashed hands. And the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they washed their hands often, or uh, the uh, uh, it, again in little number five out by the word oft in my Bible and in the margin it says or diligently uh, in the original uh, with the fists uh, up to the elbow that's that's what it literally means you know they had a, a manner that, that, that they went in and they washed it uh, up to the elbow and they, they held them up and they let them drip and they had a, a particular manner of washing hands it wasn't just a matter of, uh, of washing your hands except you see, except they washed their hands diligently up to the elbow, they wouldn't eat. Where did they get this? Holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold as the washings of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tablets. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not your disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? And he said, Well, as Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, as people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God... You hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Oh, the problem was that they elevated tradition above God's law. They elevated the, they elevated the tradition uh, above God. God's law. And they came up with all sorts of, uh, of uh, things that, uh, that, were, uh, that were there. I, I, let me just read you uh, a little bit here concerning uh, uh, a couple of things. Let me read you a little bit concerning the Sabbath. Again, I'm reading from this, from this Jewish publication, The Essential uh, Talmud. The basic view of the Sabbath as a day of rest appears very simple, but it arouses a number of problems when put into practice. Oh, first and foremost, it is necessary to establish the definition of labor. Oh, so they had to decide what labor is. The oral tradition uh, goes on to say, uh, the, the oral tradition comments on this, and uh, that the... Uh, that the uh, uh, statement in the Bible they said well the prohibition is not related to the definition of labor or to the payment of money but to the injunction to refrain from acts of deliberate creation in the physical world the children of Israel are called upon to refrain from creative work on this day so then they went on and said that the uh, uh, they looked at the tabernacle since that they weren't to work on the tabernacle that was specifically forbidden. And so they analyzed the categories of basic activity carried out during the construction of the tabernacle and summed up a list of 39 basic labors. Prototypes of the work 
forbidden and permitted on the Sabbath. Each of these 39 uh, basic categories of labor uh, has its offspring uh, that uh, different in, in detail. Uh, so it says, uh, for instance, they came to the conclusion that writing is forbidden on the Sabbath. Uh, what are the significant limits of writing? Uh, they decided that two letters constituted a significant unit so that the writing of more than one letter would be regarded as work in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, okay, the work that does not call for mental effort is not creating. A man who carries out a certain action unthinkingly and later discovered he's created something is not engaging in work since his uh, efforts lack the component of intention. And so they, various uh, ways of doing that, they, uh, uh, so they came to the conclusion that, uh, uh, according to one rabbi, that a man who intended to pick a certain bunch of grapes and picked another bunch instead had not been truly working, even if as far as he was concerned there was a, no practical difference between them. Uh, the uh, now commerce as such does not belong within the general framework of creative work uh, since uh, whatever it produces is not physically evident so then they had uh, problems with that the uh, uh, there was uh, a prohibition against the handling of certain objects and utensils that were related to work forbidden on the Sabbath the uh, goes on in general in the general sense the numerous Sabbath laws are an expanding network of minute detail deriving from several basic concepts which eventually can create an almost gothic structure made up of thousands upon thousands of tiny and meticulously fashioned details clustered around the original form now the point is what Jesus Christ was commenting on in the New Testament was not uh, downplaying the importance of keeping the Sabbath what he was commenting upon was the thousands upon thousands of tiny, meticulously fashioned details that were the tradition of the elders that did not uh, constitute the... Uh, that. Uh, you, you get into uh, all sorts of things. The... Uh, uh, So we, we find that uh, uh, the laws of ritual purity and impurity take up a whole order of the Mishnah, which is part of the Talmud, even more than sacrificial law. And uh, they go into uh, the laws of purity are essentially a complex unified network uh, interrelated and it goes in uh, the Talmud devoted considerable space to them. Offered no explanations. The... Uh, so it uh, uh, and they uh, managed to well to show you the extreme that they uh, uh, that they go to on on some of these things they uh, So there were all sorts of, of just details that uh, that they created uh, in their own uh, in their own process of developing uh, really their law apart from the Bible. I think it's important to understand that many of the things that are uh, practiced by the Jews uh, go way beyond uh, what God ever. Uh, decided or intended because the principle that Christ gave the the process is not a matter of some intricate uh, reasoning to come up with some complicated formula it is a simple basic approach the law is a statement of principles of guidelines of things that are to direct our path it can direct our path in physical matters. It can direct our path in spiritual matters. It can direct our path in civil matters or in ceremonial matters. Now, the ceremonial, we, I intend to go through some of that uh, in, in, in a, a later Bible study in this series because there are many lessons that were contained there, and I think it's good for us to go through. And one of the things we'll see is, of course, 
that you cannot divide the law clearly into these categories with no overlap. Many of this of the physical how do you divide physical and spiritual? Now on one level we know there are physical principles that God has set in motion. We're physical creatures. But you know if you think about it the Ten, you, the ten Commandments based upon God's great spiritual law of love that's, that's spiritual. But when the commandment says thou shalt not steal that is prohibiting a physical action. When it says thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery those involve spiritual sins but they also involve physical actions ultimately everything we do is physical on the other hand there are physical things physical prohibitions against eating certain things for instance and yet when you go through the law in Leviticus it makes it plain God says don't eat this because you are to be a holy people unto me you are to be separate and I want you to recognize that you are separate and distinct from all the nations. And so you make a distinction in terms of what you eat and don't eat. So God uses physical things to teach spiritual principles and spiritual laws uh, in regulate our physical conduct. So there is a certain, uh, a certain interaction. Uh, there are ceremonial aspects uh, sometimes to uh, laws that were basically physical in nature. Uh, laws of sanitation, hygiene, uh, diet, uh, things of that sort, and yet there were often ceremonial aspects that were to uh, use those physical principles to inculcate certain spiritual concepts as well. Uh, so you you find that uh, uh, sometimes the civil statutes involved uh, also were based upon physical principles uh, that God had set in motion. So there is an interrelationship. Ultimately, the basis of all of God's law is the law of love. God is love. That's God's basic nature, most basic character. And the laws that are spiritual are the laws that relate to the interrelationship of man and his neighbor and man and his God. You see, Christ summarized the law as saying that as we saw back here in, in Matthew we didn't uh, read it we read in Matthew 23 but in Matthew 22 in verse 36 uh, a lawyer asked him what is the great commandment in the law and Jesus said you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your uh, soul and with all your mind this is the first and great commandment the second is likened to it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets so the summation of God's basic law is love love toward God love toward neighbor the apostle Paul tells us uh, speaking of the law that the law is spiritual that uh, and the, uh, he tells us that in, in uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 12 that the law is holy the commandment is holy and just and good uh, in verse 14 of Romans 7 he says we know the law is spiritual in verse 22 he calls it the law of God and he says I delight in the law of God after the end of man so the law is spiritual there is a great spiritual law of love toward God and love toward neighbor. And ultimately, the principles of God's law, the detailed principles of God's law, are an amplification of how you express love toward God and how you express love toward neighbor. You see, even the ceremonial laws were to teach them lessons about a relationship with God, which involves love toward God. Even the civil statutes were to teach them and to regulate the interaction of neighbors. And the way that, because when you get even down to regulating property and regulating crime and punishment, you're regulating the way that neighbors deal with one another. Uh, there was an application given to a civil nation, given to a carnal nation, it was not being called to, to repentance and conversion, but 
there again was was that principle. Even the uh, the the physical uh, the physical laws uh, have a certain uh, application or, or or connection. Now we say physical laws because we re- we recognize that God is the great lawgiver. That there are principles of cause and effect. There are things that are designed to work and function in a particular way and things that are designed not to work and function in another way. When we are introduced, for instance, back in the book of Genesis to uh, the time of the flood and to Noah and the instructions that God gave Noah, uh, and he told Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 19, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall you bring on the ark to keep them alive, the male and his female. Uh, fowls after their kind, the creeping thing, two of every sort. And you shall take unto you of all food that is eaten, uh, and it, it is uh, to be this. So he was commanded to make uh, this, uh, to make this ark. Uh, and coming on down in chapter 7, verse 2, of every clean beast, uh, of every clean beast, you shall take to you by sevens, the male and female, and his female. And of beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his, his female. The fowls also of the air, by sevens, the male and his female, to keep the seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Now, what do we find? We find that there was a knowledge of clean and unclean all the way back at the time of Noah. Moses did not invent clean and unclean. There was a distinction of clean and unclean meats before the ceremonial law, before the priesthood of Aaron was ever developed. There were principles that God had established from creation. God is the creator. He designed certain things for certain functions. Now God could have very easily made all animal flesh good to eat he could have made you know he could have made animals like plants basically if it tastes good it's uh, you know okay to eat it and if it uh, usually the things that uh, you, you know have people God doesn't give you a list of plants in the Bible that are that are uh, uh, that are unclean plants yet uh, we know certainly that there are plants that, that aren't good to eat uh, you know, a uh, person wouldn't go out and make a salad out of poison ivy leaves, uh, at least not uh, more than once, probably. Uh, there, there's a very immediate effect. And so people know that, and they stay clear of it. The, uh, uh, the point is, God did not make animal flesh in quite that way. You know, if he did, then uh, most of the population of... Uh, the world, and certainly most of the population of this part of the country, uh, would have, uh, uh, you know, all of us probably sitting here, and myself included, you know, I think back some of the things I ate growing up, and, and uh, you know, go out in the woods, and, and if uh, uh, you could kill it and bring it home, well, uh, you eat it. And, uh, you, you know, you think about some of those things, and, and, and just is sort of revolting when you consider what you used to put in your mouth. But, you know, we, we thought it was okay. And you know what? You didn't, I didn't keel over dead when I ate uh, catfish or, or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pig or, or uh, squirrel mulligan stew or, or uh, uh, you, you know, whatever it was. Uh, uh, any of the, uh, uh, the various things, and I, I can think of a few worse than some of those, uh, if you can categorize some as being worse than the others. The point is, God gave us instruction. Now, God could have made it to where either all flesh was was fine to eat, or there was some obvious physical distinction so much that you take one bite and you spit it out and say, oh, that's horrible, that's got to be poison, you know. Uh, Certain... uh, certain, uh, uh, vegetation is that way, you know. You, you all somebody's got to do is try to take a bite of it and, and find out. Well, you know, the animals don't even eat that, uh, and, and uh, uh, you, you steer clear of it. 
But God did not choose to do it that way. Now, He did design certain animals to be consumed and others not to. But, we are dependent on the instructions God gives us. Now, when we look at those instructions, there are some things we can figure out. Uh, there, uh, you know, if you know that some of these things are not fit to eat, and you begin to do some research and some study into it, you can find that there are certain problems and certain complications with it. Uh, there are certain diseases uh, that come as a result of, of certain unclean animals. There are certain health problems uh, that are connected to the eating of blood and fat. But, uh, you know, how much uh, of various sausages and uh, boudin and things like that have people eaten? And, uh, you know, at least temporarily, they survived to tell the tale. Loaded up with all the things God says don't put in there. It's almost like somebody went through, got a list of the things they weren't supposed to put in, and dumped all that. But, you know, God has, has regulated it so that we're forced to make a, a distinction between the clean and the unclean in, in life and that we are continually coming in contact with both and we're having to choose one and reject the other. Now, they're physical matters, but you know, God has designed it that way to also teach us a spiritual point. That as we go through life, we're continually coming in contact with clean and unclean. Clean and unclean actions, clean and unclean thoughts, we are being trained that we need to be conscious of all ways in every facet of our life making a distinction between the clean and the unclean. Rejecting the unclean, choosing the clean. God designed it that way. It would have been very simple, you know, if you're creating, God could have given every uh, mammal the digestive system of a cow. You know, why couldn't a catfish have had the same digestive system uh, of a bass or a perch? Well, they don't. Why, why, why did God do it? Why did he make that distinction? Well, he chose to, and he chose to put us in that situation. Now, let's look at some of the, the uh, physical laws. Uh, let's look, uh, for instance... Uh, at uh, the laws of clean and unclean meats. We go back to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. We have the the uh, regulation. I have, by the way, uh, and any of, uh, your, any of you are welcome to it, uh, a listing of biblically clean fish. Usually the question comes up with fish uh, more than it comes up, more frequently than it comes up with other animals because most of the others are uh, fairly simple most of the time when you get fish unless there's something you catch locally if you buy them uh, you don't know whether they had scales or fins or what so if any of you uh, would like this I have uh, uh, a I have a listing here uh, of, uh, uh, of clean and unclean fish or of the clean fish in uh, then uh, down at the bottom it lists a a, a list of uh, uh, of the unclean the uh, of, of the unclean uh, fish the uh, in, Deuteron- in, in Leviticus 11 in, in verse 2 speaking to the children of Israel saying these are the beasts that you may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth whatsoever parts the hoof and is cloven-footed, and choose the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So, very simple. Choose, it divides the hoof, and choose the cud. Then he specifically spells out, these shall you not eat. Uh, because some of them chew the cud, but they don't divide the hoof, and some of them divide the hoof, but don't chew the cud. And so it uh, spells out uh, various animals here, uh, including... Uh, the uh, the camel or the coney or a little rock badger, uh, the hare or rabbit, uh, the the pig, and uh, it just spells some out that they were familiar with. And it says uh, in verse eight, of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch; uh, they are unclean to you. 
in verse 9, These shall you eat um, of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever has uh, fins and scales in the waters, uh, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall you eat. All that have not fins and scales uh, of all that move in the waters shall be an abomination. And uh, uh, you're not to eat their flesh. You shall have their carcasses an abomination. Verse 11, whatsoever uh, has no fins nor scales uh, in the waters, that shall be an abomination to you. So uh, he goes through. He does not give a detailed listing. He simply says fins and scales. And uh, this listing is is uh, goes through uh, that. And then these are they which you shall have an abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. And it goes through and lists uh, various ones: the eagle, the uh, uh, the vulture, uh, the raven, the owl, the uh, night hawk, uh, the uh, various ki- kinds of uh, uh, of uh, owls and and uh, things of this sort. And uh, uh, we find that there were uh, clear, there's basically a listing of the things not to eat. And uh, from that, of course, we uh, deduce the others that uh, uh, are available to eat, such as uh, the the chicken, the duck, the the turkey, the goose, the the, uh, the various uh, birds that are mentioned even elsewhere as uh, being utilized in, in the sacrifices, uh, these uh, various categories of, of, uh, of birds. Birds uh, generally aren't as much of a problem. Uh, there are obviously some of these birds here that uh, uh, these are not, let's say, the things that are uh, normally eaten by, by most here. Uh, that... Uh, and then uh, there are, uh, there were even some, uh, certain creeping things of the uh, locust or grasshopper family, uh, a certain type, uh, that were also permissible. And it says in verse 24, For these you shall be unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the evening. Whosoever bears any of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. Now, again, the principle here, here are physical principles of health. God set and set certain animals, uh, and, and, you know, you find a dead one, well, it died of something. And so here are physical principles, here are physical laws. God says you go out and you pet something like that, and you, you, you've gotten it on you, you need, to, you need to wash. Now, we tend to take some of these things for granted because we live in a, in a society where water is rather plentiful, and it's a fairly simple matter to throw something in the washing machine. But you know, uh, if you had to carry water from, from a distance uh, in a bucket or a pot, uh, and you had to, or you had to go down to the creek and wash your clothes, uh, the tendency would be to sort of skimp on, uh, on washing clothes and taking baths. And, uh, you know, some of us remember when uh, uh, we didn't have running water, and... Uh, uh, you, you know, you, there, there wasn't uh, some of what a lot, uh, people take for granted today. Uh, the frequency of bathing well, wasn't quite so simple, wasn't quite so easy. You know, it was Saturday night whether you needed it or not. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of sponge off in between. Uh, clothes were uh, not as uh, frequently washed. You know, if you got if you got to take them out and, and uh, uh, boil them in the old wash pot, uh, you got to use a scrub board and eagle eye soap and... and uh, uh, that becomes quite a that becomes quite a chore, and uh, uh, it, you know. So you, the point that I'm making is that we take for granted many of these principles that are spelled out here. God spelled them out. They were matters of physical health. They were matters of sanitation. They were matters of hygiene. God spelled them out. He says you're unclean. That just means you're you're dirty. You're unclean. You need to you need to clean up. Until you come uh, before you come back in, uh, speaking there of of the camp, and there were also uh, restrictions uh, that were there. It wasn't uh, wasn't a crime to touch these animals. He just said you're unclean. You need to, you need to wash. You need to to uh, to uh, clean up. You need to wash your clothes. And that that when you uh, come in contact with these things, you need to to uh, be washed. And 
so he goes through and uh, that uh, goes in, into uh, uh, all of the, the uh, great distinction in, in verse 29 these shall also be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep on the earth the weasel, the mouse, the tortoise uh, verse twenty, uh, verse thirty: the ferret, the chamele- uh, chameleon, the uh, lizard, the snail, the mole. Uh, these are unclean unto you among all that creep. Uh, whosoever does touch them, uh, when they be dead, shall be unclean until the evening. Uh, and upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, does fall, it shall be unclean. And uh, whether it be a vessel or of wood or raiment or skin or sack or whatever vessel it is, it's unclean. Uh, it must be put in the water. It shall be unclean until the evening. So shall it be cleansed. Uh, in an earthen vessel, where any of them fall, uh, it is unclean, and you break it. You know, if it was cloth or if it was metal, you could take it out and, and, and scrub it and wash it, and it was fine. What would happen if you had an earthen pottery? You know, the porous. You ever seen porous pottery uh, vessels? You know, the kind that a lot of times you get in Mexico or something of that sort. They, they often use that in cooking what happens if you find something crawled up in there and die what do you do with it God said don't take it down and wash it just break it you know and, and they were fairly simple to, to replace you know it was no uh, big deal but he said, there's no way you can you can uh, you can really cleanse something like that he didn't go through and explain to them all about germs and bacteria uh, but if something crawled up in there and died uh you couldn't, you couldn't scrub it. You couldn't get it clean because it's porous and, and, and it just, uh, uh, you know, it, it would contaminate whatever came into it later. You may get sick, you may not, but God says, look, that's unclean. It can't be scrubbed out uh, in a way that if you had something of iron or even something cloth or, or uh, uh, any of the other things that he mentioned here uh, that, uh, that could, be, uh, could be cleaned. And uh, so he talks about uh, these things uh, in verse 35 the uh, ovens are ranges for pots uh, broken down and that's not uh, that's again talking about these uh, these the ovens that they use were normally clay ovens you know that they constructed and they, they still often use them in the Middle East uh, they are uh, they, they're simply sun dried uh, clay they were they were utilized uh, and they that's what they put the bread on and things like that and he says if something uh, unclean gets in there and comes in contact with it, uh, you, uh, you you just break it and get you another, make you another. Uh, that does not, from a practical standpoint, uh, most of this doesn't uh, apply to most of us because that's not what we normally use to cook in. Uh, you know, we tend to use uh, glass and porcelain and and, and uh, metal and, and things of that sort to, to cook in. So. Uh, those things it's permissible simply to wash uh, as was uh, spelled out uh, up here a little earlier uh, but the things that were clay and he talks about uh, uh, that uh, you know water for instance uh, uh, you know a fountain or a pit uh, verse 36 if there's plenty of water it'll be clean that which touches their carcass shall be unclean in other words if if, if you found some dead animal down here in, in the pool, you don't drink the water that's in the that's in the pool. But if it's a if it's a running spring, well, it hasn't contaminated the source of, of the spring. So God gave them instructions relating to to hygiene, relating to sanitation. He says if it's fallen among uh, sowing seed, uh, you know that's okay. You can go ahead and plant the seed. That hasn't hurt the seed. Uh, but uh, uh, so he he goes through and gives detailed uh, instructions. And uh, uh, so he says in verse 43, You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that you shall be defiled thereby, for I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. I am the eternal that brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. This is the law of the beast and of the fowl and of every living thing that moves in the waters and of every creature that creeps upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. You see, God purposely 
design things so that we are confronted with the need to make a difference, to make a distinction. Now, he cleaves the hoof, uh, uh, and cleaves the cleft into two claws, and chews the cud among the beasts that shall you eat. He goes through the things, uh, again, uh, the basic uh, principles uh, that we have already uh, gone through. And uh, in verse 21, they were told, You shall not eat of anything that dies of itself. You know, this is speaking of, of, of a clean animal. So here's a, an additional thing. They, uh, uh, they were also told, they were given permission that, that in that category, uh, if uh, that it was permissible uh, that if some of the uh, Gentiles who dwelt among them wanted it, they, they were permitted to uh, let them have it, uh, but they were not to eat of it themselves, uh, that they could uh, pass it on, uh, but not uh, the uh, unclean. Or these, this happened. This referred to clean animals that died of themselves. So an animal was to be properly slaughtered. The uh, uh, now, as we uh, as we uh, come on here, we find that there are. Uh, more uh, instructions. We find clean and unclean meat. So let's go back uh, to Leviticus uh, chapter 17. And let's put together various clean and uh, various laws relating physical laws of clean and unclean in terms of, of food that we're to eat. Leviticus uh, 17 in uh, verse 10 it says whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eats any manner of blood I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will cut him off from among his people the life of the flesh is in the blood I have given it un, uh, given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls it is the blood that makes an atonement uh, no soul shall eat blood neither shall any stranger that sojourns among you eat blood so uh, goes on verse 13 says if you're out hunting and you catch a beast or a fowl that may be eaten verse 13 you shall even pour out the blood thereof and, it, and cover it with dust so on down in verse 14 you shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof and uh, uh, verse 15 every soul that eats that which died of itself or that which was torn by beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, uh, he shall both wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening, and he shall be clean. Uh, but, uh, so, they were not to uh, eat something that had died of itself, or something that had been, uh, uh, you know, they come upon, that had been killed by uh, uh, animals. Uh, they were not to eat the blood. Uh, this God did not design blood to be uh, eaten by human beings, and he used it to uh, illustrate something uh, very important and very sacred. So uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, the blood was not to be, uh, uh, was not to be consumed. Now, uh, also, there are uh, uh, other principles that uh, uh, relate in there as well. That uh, uh, when you come uh, when you come to the uh, uh, the matter of fat, uh, back in Leviticus chapter seven. Leviticus chapter seven and verse twenty two. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, you shall eat no manner of fat, of ox or of sheep or of goat, the fat of the beast that dies of itself, the fat of that which is torn with beast, uh, may be used in any other use, but you shall in no wise eat of it. So it could be uh, utilized, uh, you know, in the making of soap or something of that sort, uh, uh, tallow could. Uh, it could be used for candles, could be used for a variety of things, but it was not to be used to be eaten. Whosoever eats the fat, verse 25, of the beast, uh, of which men offer an offering made by fire, that soul shall be cut off from his people. You shall eat no manner of blood, verse 26, whether it be uh, a fowl uh, or beast any of your dwelling. Now, if you notice, 
the the fat that they were not to eat was the fat of mammals, fat of oxen, sheep, or goats. Uh, there was not the prohibition against the fat of poultry. Uh, you know, chicken fat, uh, in that sense, was not prohibited, and the Jews have never understood that it was, that, that uh, chicken fat could be utilized in, in cooking or something of that sort, uh, though there may you know, because of cutting back on calories or things of that sort, we may, we may uh, want to take that off. But that is not biblically prohibited. Uh, but uh, the fat of, uh, of cattle or sheep or goats or things of that sort uh, are. And all blood, uh, whether it is uh, fowl or beast, verse 26, you're to eat no manner of blood, uh, the fowl or the beast. So uh, you can utilize the, the fat of uh, a fowl, but not of uh, not the blood of anything. So again, uh, we see uh, a little bit more that uh, is uh, is spelled out. We see that we're not to uh, to eat the fat of mammals. We're not to utilize blood uh, in terms of food. We're not to eat something that dies of itself or that was uh, killed and torn by uh, wild animals even if it's a clean animal. You know, you don't know how, from a health standpoint, you don't know how long the thing's laid there. You, a lot of things you don't know about it. And uh, uh, God just said, no, you don't do that. Uh, and certainly we're not to eat the flesh of unclean animals. Now let's go on a, uh, uh, a little further. There are uh, other uh, laws concerning... Uh, uh, concerning sanitation and uh, cleanliness that we find particularly uh, in the uh, uh, we find uh, many of them here in the uh, book of Deuteronomy in uh, uh, coming on back in chapter 12 uh, laws per, uh, pertaining to uh, motherhood now we find um, that we find two different Things that are that come to be involved here, we find that uh, uh, there are matters of health. There's obviously a health basis, but many of these laws also have a ceremonial aspect because they involve uh, coming in uh, to the uh, tabernacle or to the temple and offering a certain offering uh, to make an atonement. And uh, to uh, various things that, that were to be done in terms of the ceremonial priesthood. So uh, clearly that aspect uh, does not uh, does not apply. But the fact that uh, the uh, when it says that uh, uh, you, you have to understand when the, when. Uh, it said that a woman uh, who's conceived a child, born a man-child, in Leviticus 12, 2, that she shall be unclean seven days, uh, according to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the child is to be uh, uh, is to be uh, circumcised. Now, what did it mean to be unclean? That just meant that you weren't to go out in public. You couldn't come into the tabernacle. Basically, the practical effect was that... Uh, you know, stay home and, and rest, and and, uh, uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, young women engender a lot of health problems later on in life because they get up and around doing too much too soon after a child is born, and uh, they may not feel it then. But I, I've uh, had many many uh, older women uh, make the point uh, to me over the years that uh, a lot of health problems that they had in later years. They traced back to some of the things that to some of the work they did and the things they did right after childbirth. Well, uh, the principle that God gave here was uh, basically stay down and out of commission for a week, and, and then the eighth day, uh, then they could bring the child in to be circumcised. Well, a little baby doesn't need to be out and uh, be exposed and, and in any sort of public setting right away. Uh, there are ceremonial aspects, but you're looking at physical principles of, of, uh, of sanitation and hygiene. And uh, uh, then there was a uh, continuation of, of uh, uh, just in verse 44, that uh, uh, where it primarily has to do with uh, uh, 
the fact that there's a continuing discharge from, from a woman for a period of time that uh, uh, takes place. It mentions here, uh, you, you know, she continues in the blood of her purifying 33 days. Well, if you add 33 and 7, that's 40 days. You know, normally a doctor will talk about six weeks. Well, how long is six weeks? 42 days. You know, so that's basically that's what God said all along. You know, medical science finally, 20th century, they, they uh, uh, say certain matters. But uh, uh, the fact that, that there's a uh, before, let's say, full normal uh, activity resumes and, and marital uh, activity uh, resumes that there is a period of time that pa- that, uh, that takes place and while this is tied in with a ceremonial aspect there's also a very practical physical uh, aspect that comes out on down in chapter 13 it has to do with uh, a certain of the health laws that uh, uh, in terms of uh, contagious diseases some of the uh, skin uh, diseases it talks about a plague of leprosy which is not exactly what we think of as leprosy uh, today it, it was a uh, an infectious or contagious uh, skin disease and chapter uh, 13 and 14 uh, goes on in uh, to uh, much of that and it simply uh, goes through the instructions to the priesthood as to how they were to recognize something that was contagious from something uh, that wasn't and uh, they were in the role of public health officials and again, this is something that uh, uh, we don't have a Levitical priesthood that's functioning, but uh, uh, just here were principles that they were given based on, you know, physical laws. The priest, verse 3 of Leviticus 13, was to look on the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of the flesh, it is the plague of leprosy. You know, this is something that is serious, you know, when it is... Uh, uh, coming in that the flesh is, is appearing to rot away and, and the hair is, is uh, changing color uh, if that uh, it goes on in verse 4 if the bright spot, a spot be white in the skin of the flesh uh, but it's not uh, deeper than the skin it's not something that is eating away at the skin and the hair is not turned white uh, then uh, the priest uh, keeps him uh, in quarantine for 7 days and checks it over again and the basic principle that God gave Israel in terms of health laws were laws of sanitation uh, and hygiene and quarantine. You know, if somebody ha- appears to have an infectious disease, you keep them isolated until you know for sure. Uh, if somebody comes in contact with something that is contaminated, they are designated as unclean for a period of time. That just means that they are in some level of isolation. They're not free to just come in contact with everything and everyone until the matter is resolved. Uh, That when something has become unclean, that it needs to be washed, needs to be cleaned up. Uh, That uh, we we find that uh, certain kinds of garments that have been uh, uh, that have been contaminated or have uh, uh, talks about certain kinds of uh, mold and, and uh, certain kinds of things where garments were uh, certain cloth was to be destroyed uh, was to be burned because again uh, the tendency uh, of contagion and things to spread you have to uh, realize that we're looking in a, in a society where uh, water was sometimes a scarce commodity and was certainly inconvenient to utilize many times and so if if, if the details weren't spelled out, people didn't do it. This is what's happening right now in Sudan and many of these areas uh, where uh, they, they bring them in, they bring the refugee camps and the Red Cross is feeding them uh, and they're, they're, they're getting something to eat, but they're still dying because contamination and disease just spreads through everything. The uh, So you have all of these things that are done and on through... Uh, chapter 14 and chapter 15 that uh, deal with matters of uh, you know physical things uh, it certainly uh, deals even with the matter of um, uh, marital relations and, and uh, the, uh, uh, the matter of, of a, uh, a woman's monthly cycle that uh, uh, you know God uh, gave certain prohibitions there and um, the specifics 
that are gone through here in terms of of um, of clean and unclean, and there are many uh, different things that uh, uh, relate uh, very clearly to uh, uh, to uh, clean and unclean, and the things that uh, uh, are not to be uh, uh, you know not to be utilized. So we find over and over that God uh, lays a great emphasis on matters of sanitation, matters of hygiene, and. Uh, um, these things are are uh, uh, these things are there. We find uh, uh, much of this is given in the book of Leviticus. Some of it is also uh, detailed back in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy as well, and uh, uh, as to the way that some of these things were to be uh, were to be done. Um, Chapter 23 of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, deals specifically here with uh, the people when they're encamped. And uh, it talks about... Uh, um, uncleanness in verse 10. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness... Uh, the chance is him by night. He shall go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. Uh, but it shall be when evening comes on, he'll wash himself with water and the sun has gone down. Uh, he shall come into the camp again. Uh, if you want to find out when the evening is, it's when the sun goes down. You know, some have been confusion here. Uh, just make a comment. Uh, you know, some have been confused about when, uh, you know, when is evening. You know, the Sabbath, we observe the Sabbath from evening to evening. Some have been confused, you know. Well, is it uh, sunset or total darkness? Well, I, we never used to be confused. You know, Mr. Armstrong was never confused on the matter. But uh, it spells it out right here. Uh, it says in verse 11, It shall be when evening comes on, he shall wash himself with water, and when the sun is down, he'll come into the camp again. Over and over you see that evening that you're unclean until evening. Well, when is evening? When the sun goes down. So the Bible defines its own terms, you know. You don't have to go to some uh, great, uh, uh, you know, get every uh, Jewish rabbi. The Jewish rabbis, this isn't the Talmud. The Talmud, if, if I had the volumes of the Talmud, they'd fill up this, this table. This is just a sort of a little summary of some of the things. That's the kind of stuff that you get from the Jewish rabbis. That's what they've come up with. You know, the Bible is simple and, and, and defines its own terms. So, uh, evening and sunset are, are are made very plain here. Deuteronomy 23.11. That wasn't the main point that I was making. But uh, verse 12 says, You shall have a point, uh, a place without the camp. They shall go forth abroad. And they have a paddle upon their weapon. And it'll be when you ease yourself abroad, you dig uh, therewith and uh, turn back and cover that which comes from you. Well, now that's a, a pretty... Uh, uh, you know, simple elemental thing, but you know, you, you consider the fact that uh, disease epidemics are sweeping through, again, uh, everywhere from Mexico to a lot of these third world countries uh, because raw sewage is, is out there in ditches and, and dump, uh, dumped in the streets. Uh, people, uh, you know, just incredible. God says, look, you go out to get away from where everybody else is and, and, and uh, uh, you, you cover it up with dirt. It's not just lying out there exposed. Uh, very elemental basic laws now we take most of these things for granted because uh, our society uh, here in the United States uh, is geared to where uh, you know soap and water is pretty cheap and, and uh, we have indoor plumbing and we've got a lot of conveniences and it's very convenient uh, to uh, be more sanit- uh, sanitary than what often people have been in the past you know I don't think it's been fully appreciated how much of a difference has been made uh, in terms of the the rise in in uh, let's say the 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 the, uh, well the increase of the of the uh, of age the the number of people surviving uh, till later in life the uh, decline of the death rate I don't think that it has been fully appreciated how much of that in the 20th century 
is attributable uh, is probably more than any other factor to, to the increase in sanitation and hygiene. You know, apart from all of the things that uh, man's medical science has done, just laws of sanitation and hygiene uh, go a long way to reducing just the, the, the spread of plagues and infectious diseases. And if you add in the principle of quarantine, you notice that God primarily gave Israel uh, matters he focused in, in in preventative areas. He focused in on diet, certain things to be eaten, certain things to be avoided. He focused in on on sanitation, uh, on, on being uh, uh, hygienic, he fo- uh, being being clean in all aspects of life, of, of bathing, of washing clothes, washing utensils, uh, of when something became unclean, uh, that it had to be cleansed. You realize that, that the one of the greatest problems that existed, and this was as late as, as the 1860s, the, the American War between the states, that, that uh, battlefield surgeons would go from one soldier to another just wiping their knife on their britches and, and, and go on to the next one, and that... Uh, uh, plague and and and, and uh, uh, disease just spread through the camps. Uh, that that killed far more far more died of, of infection than than died of the actual one. Uh, it was just a, a lack of sanitation and hygiene. When you go through and you take these principles, uh, you, you uh, realize that uh, when some when blood touched something, it became unclean and it had to be washed. Well, that, you know, that uh, if, if the battlefield physicians of, of centuries past uh, had just practiced that one principle, I think how many lives would have, been, would have been saved. You know, a lot of these things are very basic, but God reveals physical principles. And some of them are maybe very basic, but particularly the ones about clean and unclean meats, people still... Uh, don't regard. I mean, you know, maybe the doctor tells people, well, you shouldn't be eating all these fats, bad for your blood pressure, and pork is, uh, causes uh, various problems and, and things of that sort. But, you know, people don't pay a whole lot of attention to that. But God gives uh, those uh, principles, uh, various physical laws that uh, are brought out. Now, there are other, there are other uh, uh, physical uh, principles as well that... Uh, um, that uh, that come out that uh, also tie in uh, as far as uh, just even the uh, the matter of uh, uh, how that uh, let's say the the ecology and, and man's relationship with the uh, with the environment uh, that uh, is. Uh, uh, you know, spelled out, and uh, uh, this uh, this sort of thing is is uh, spelled out and, and uh, detailed. That uh, we find that, for instance, back in uh, we find some of it here in the book of Deuteronomy, and we find some of it uh, back in uh, back in Leviticus. That uh, uh, in Deuteronomy twenty two. Um, in verse 6 it says if a bird's nest chance to be before you in the way in any tree or in the ground whether there be young ones or eggs or the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs you shall not take the dam with the young uh, you shall in any wise let the dam go and take the young to you it may be well with you that you may prolong your days uh, now you know here's a very simple principle of the ecology that uh, uh, this is talking about uh, uh, the fact that you don't What of course would happen when you if, if you come on a bird's nest and you kill the mother bird and you uh, uh, maybe take the eggs or take the uh, take the young? Well, it wouldn't be long. You don't have any birds. You know that's uh, you, if you kill the young and you kill the and you kill the mother, you're going to wipe out uh, a species. And, and so here was a tendency of people. God just said, "Look, you're you're coming through. Uh, don't." Uh, uh, you know, you're out uh, plowing or something like that. Uh, don't, uh, you know, don't kill the mother and uh, the young or, or, or the eggs. If you disturb the nest, uh, make uh, let the mother go. And that way there will be other uh, young birds. And uh, you will prolong your days. He says, uh, 
verse 28, and this in many ways was a uh, you know a civil statute, but he just uh, said, you make a new house, make a battlement for your roof. You know, here was uh, uh, here was a matter that uh, uh, they usually had flat roofs. He said, build a railing. You know, build a railing around it. Don't want somebody falling off and getting killed. Uh, verse 9, you're not to sow your vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of your seed which you have sown and the fruit of the vineyard be defiled. Uh, this had to do with an improper mixing of, of seeds. You know, certain things will cross. And uh, uh, God emphasized purity. He emphasized purity uh, and not just uh, the degeneration that takes place when things uh, are allowed to, uh, to, to uh, cross in that way. So he said, uh, verse 10, uh, that, uh, Don't plow the ox and the ass together. Uh, you... Shall not, you shall not wear a garment of diverse sorts as, as of uh, woolen and linen. Now, uh, woolen and linen uh, have to do with uh, uh, animal and vegetable fiber mixed together. You know, you can mix uh, a lot of the synthetics. Normally, the synthetics are made to where they, uh, they, they uh, match with and are used with either the... Uh, uh, the vegetable fiber or the uh, uh, the animal fiber. Uh, you know, we uh, linen or cotton is more commonly used by us as vegetable fiber, and, and uh, uh, woolen, of course, as a, as a, an animal fiber. God said, uh, just as a, as a matter of uh, a principle here, that uh, that was not something that ought to normally be mixed. He emphasized again that principle back in Leviticus 19. Verse 19, he says, You shall uh, keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed. Neither shall a, a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon you. Well, these were physical matters. Uh, there's not uh, certainly the principle of, of uh, purity that is emphasized. God uh, designed certain things uh, in a certain way. But uh, uh, primarily... Uh, physical matters that were, uh, you know, that were uh, uh, that were involved. The uh, and uh, um, you have uh, various other uh, various other principles uh, that are brought out as well. As far as uh, uh, let's just notice in uh, Deuteronomy twenty the principles that tied in. Deuteronomy 20, um, verse 19. When you shall besiege a city a long time in making war against it, you shall not destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them, uh, that you may eat thereof, and you shall not cut them down. For the tree of the field is man's life to employ them in the siege. Only the trees which you know, uh, that they be not trees uh, for meat, uh, you you shall destroy and cut them down. You shall build book works against the city that makes war with you until it be subdued. So here again, God just gave a principle. You're going in even if you're involved in a warfare. You don't just involve yourself in a wanton destruction of the uh, uh, of the land. You don't just destroy the crops and destroy the uh, uh, the trees there. That uh, the trees particularly takes uh, uh, decades for them to grow and, and really get on up where they're they're productive. And to just come in and just cut them down uh, in a wanton way uh, is foolish, and it's uh, destructive of the uh, destructive of the environment. So, again, many of these physical principles, <coughs> some of it carries through in terms of civil regulation, in terms of ceremonial regulation, and in terms of uh, uh, in, in their even spiritual overtones on many of these things. It's not uh, simply a matter of being able to. Uh, uh, it's not simply a matter of being able to go through and uh, uh, clearly divide out or make a distinction between all the uh, the various categories of law. But the point is that God orders His creation. You know, God is the creator and he orders his creation. And so he set in motion laws uh, of the way things ought to function. And some of those simply apply to the physical environment around us. 
that man was given lordship, he was given dominion, but he was given instruction that uh, he is to be considerate. He's to be considerate of the animals that uh, we'll cover some of these later in civil statutes, but uh, you know, he was told that if he saw uh, an animal that uh, even if it belonged to his neighbor that, that was uh, hurt or injured or, or, or stuck in a ditch or something, he was to get it out. Uh, he was to show consideration to the animals. He was to, uh, you know, aim toward purity and toward quality, whether it was in the way that he planned his field and sowed his seed or the way he uh, bred his uh, his livestock, uh, that he was to uh, uh, to take care in that way and to respect the, the basic distinctions that uh, uh, that God has, uh, has made and has designed in. Uh, and certainly the most important aspect of the physical laws in terms of, of the impact on, on human beings are all of the laws relating to clean and unclean sanitation and hygiene. And we see all of these principles that come through that God uh, regulates all the aspects uh, of his creation. And the relationship of man and his environment are regulated by physical laws of the around. Uh, next time we will go into uh, go a little further uh, into other aspects uh, of God's law and its application for us today.